Okay, Tana Koto Katoa, thank you very much for inviting me to speak, Tasman. And um, uh, it's a delight to be able to teach quite a different, a little bit of a different audience than I'm used to. Uh, not not graduate, not graduate students, and not undergrad students, and not I taught some year eights. So this is new for me, a, gr a group of science teachers. So I hope it's not. I, I hope I get the pitch right. Just, um, I'm actually not going to talk a lot about uh, too much about details of our micro, of our research or go into the details of what we've been using. But just so you understand that I get no funding from any of the um, people who make the products that we've studied in my lab. Um, but I also want to make a, another disclaimer, which is that while I'm going to talk about nutrition and its relevance to mental health, there are of course a lot of other things that are relevant as well. And if only we could address poverty or or reduce the number of the uh, number of people who get hit and uh, rates of domestic violence and trauma and exposure to other environmental toxins, et cetera, then we would go a long way to, I think, changing the statistics in our community at the moment with respect to mental health. But just to put it in context is that we really need to get that our food has changed dramatically in a very, very short period of time. <laughs> so if we think about what we are currently eating in terms of like Cheerios, Twinkies, and Span, it's a very small, small relative to the um, large number of years that we've been on the planet evolving. And to think that we have evolved to digest the types of foods that we are eating now, I think that that would be a little bit um, premature. So in terms of what our ancestors ate, insects, um, berries and grains, um, and meat, but what we eat um, and what your, the, the, your students eat, I assume, may be quite different um, from what is we hope would be a good diet. And if we consider and think about what we think of as being relevant and important when we think about what, it, what should I eat and we think about the food pyramids, people often think about the macronutrients. They'll think about proteins and carbohydrates and fats, but not necessarily consider the nutrients and those small micronutrients that are contained within our food, which I think actually is key to ensuring um, well, a good well-being in our community, but that we really have ignored to our peril. If we just consider these two types of foods, if you look at it just in terms of protein, carb, and fat content, they're almost identical, and even in calorie content. And yet, we would assume that this is probably better for us versus this. But our concentration on these particular parts of our diet means that we think, oh yeah, same time number of calories, then I'm going to eat that because that's far tastier than perhaps eating um, the hummus and uh, vegetables and uh, fruit. I think that the star rating hasn't done a great service in terms of getting us to think about food in terms of how nourishing it is. The star ratings that have just popped up on all the processed foods, it doesn't happen. You don't see a star rating on fruits and vegetables. That's actually because the assumption is that we all know that fruits and vegetables are good for us, but we need help from dietitians and nutritionists on how to navigate through the processed food section and make good decisions for which um, cereal is going to be better for us versus another cereal. And it's actually considered within the context of the energy that the food provides in terms of calories, saturated fats, which is actually a big challenging and controversial topic anyway, but we're assumed that we should be eating things, foods that are low in saturated fats low in sugars, low in so sodium, and then finally nutrient content does play a role, but it's a, a minor role, and if there's some iron in that, just one nutrient, then the star rating will go up. So I want you to think about food from a different perspective and think about the minerals and vitamins that are, are in our food. And why should we think about minerals and vitamins and why is it so relevant? And that is because they are required for the production of every, all of the different chemicals that are in our body, the production of enzymes, the production of hormones, the production of neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are particularly important for mental health because we're all, probably all aware of the role that serotonin can play in our, in our mood or dopamine in our ability to uh, pay attention, or, or noradrenaline and GABA in terms of anxiety. So they're very important uh, chemicals, and if we don't provide the body with the nutrients that are required to make those chemicals, then we are, are, are depriving our bodies of something that's really essential. 
I want to, to just touch on something that's really important again when we think about food. We often think about food with respect to the RDA or the recommended dietary allowance. And again, food labels really focus, get us to focus on ensuring that we hit the RDA, but there's almost a, a fear that we don't go above RDA. Not quite sure why, but there seems to, and I get this, but I, it comes across my desk all the time and the emails that I get from people is that you're giving people the nutrients higher than RDA. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what we do and that is okay. But RDA, because you have to understand what RDA is, and RDA is the number that's or the amount that's required of a nutrient in order to prevent you from getting a frank nutritional deficiency. So if you hit the 100% in RDA for vitamin C, then you probably won't get scurvy. Or if you hit the RDA for vitamin D, you probably won't get rickets. But it doesn't tell you what your brain needs. And given that the brain is the hungriest organ in the body, it might only be 2% of our weight, but it's between 20 to 40% of the met metabolic needs of the, of, all, of the entire body, then we need to think about what is good for optimal brain health. And RDA does not take into consideration what is optimal for brain health. And that is the, this is the area that I am working in. And so we are more important on focusing on ensuring that we don't give nutrients in a toxic amount. And so you need to be aware of the UL or the upper level. And that's a generally a very conservative number in terms of the amount that you can take on a daily basis. But we're aware of the UL. And so we tend to operate within that therapeutic range. And I would argue that in order to have good mental health and optimal mental health, I think more of us should be taking in nutrients at a much higher level than necessary RDA. But that's a controversial topic, um, to, uh, issue and not a very necessarily a very popular one. So just to give you a, a flavor of the RDA across different types of foods, I've just listed some nutrients here, some of the micronutrients in terms of minerals and vitamins, and then I looked up to see what are the, you know, in terms of what, how, how well some of the foods do that we're eating in terms of those nutrient values, just to get you to think about these micronutrients that are contained within our food. So if we think about the kiwi fruit, very high in vitamin C. In fact, some of these go beyond 100%, but I couldn't fit them all into the graph. Um, this one was with strawberries, doing really well, vitamin C, vitamin A. Um, apples actually is not remarkably um, that high. They're, it's uh, very low across the board on some of these nutrients that I went through. Brussels sprouts, you gotta love Brussels sprouts. No. Just know how to, <laughs> you just, you just need to know how to cook Brussels sprouts and then you're okay. <laughs> Salmon does quite well in terms of particularly in the minerals. Steak does quite well. Kale. Kale is the superfood. Let me show you that one again. Superfood kale in terms of getting lots of nutrients. You got good amounts of vitamin K in particular as well in kale. Um, Brazil nuts. Uh, Brazil nuts we know are very high in selenium. You just have to t consume five Brazil nuts a day and you'll really hit your... Um, Get, get a good dose of selenium, really important because of the low selenium in the soils in New Zealand. Oh, sorry, that was a donut. There's a little bit of things in there that's probably because of the calcium or the, some of the nutrients that might be contained within the milk. Um, hot dogs that you didn't see much happening there, that's because there's not much happening there. Um, English muffin, you get a little bit probably more because of the fortification um, that might be occurring within the flour. And then this last one is Coca-Cola. So just hold on, just wait, okay? This is Coca-Cola. Okay, and did you see anything change? <laughs> it's, uh, there's no nutrients in Coca-Cola. I probably didn't have to tell you this, but when I did this with a group of year eights, they, they were like, there's something wrong with your, your, know, your clicker or something because there's got to be nutrients in Coca-Cola. I'm like, no, that's the point. And But <laughs> that was the point. But I raise this because it's a serious concern. 25% of calories of the people who you teach are coming from fizzy drinks. That's what the research shows. So if you guys think that the students that you, you are teaching are going to be able to really consume the material that you're putting in front of them with a, with a high percentage of their calories coming from something that has no nutrients whatsoever, you have to wonder how much they can absorb. 
Fizzy drink consumption has been well correlated with poor mental health, increased aggression, and violence. So this is a serious concern around what we're doing in terms of allowing the, con the consumption of these foods. And I haven't even talked about the effects on obesity. So if we could even just, even if we, it, a side product of addressing the, the consumption of some of these drinks could be definitely better mental health. Um, so just in case you didn't know what a, a sort of a, what a, a, what I will call the Western diet, this is the Western diet. It's high in processed foods, it's um, high in sugary drinks, it is uh, low in your vegetables and fruit, high in takeaways, those types of foods. And I raise this because what's probably wrong with it? It is calorie rich and nutrient poor. In contrast, something that we call now and coined in this field of research, the Mediterranean diet, that is something that's high in um, fish, nuts, um, in uh, good fats, healthy fats, uh, fruits and vegetables, and low in processed foods. And what's probably good about it is it is, it is nutrient rich, lots of vitamins and minerals um, that are contained within those types of foods that you're eating. So what does all of this have to do with brain health? And so we need to just think about that when, you're, when we are consuming food, everything that we eat is going, to, is going to go eventually get into the bloodstream and feed your brain. And so if the foods that you're eating, like if the foods that you just ate for morning tea or you think about what you had for breakfast, is that going to adequately nourish your brain in order to pay attention to me for half an hour? That's what we need to be thinking about. And sometimes I think the foods that we're eating are not necessarily going to provide us with the adequate nutrition for our brains to operate at its optimal capacity. I mentioned neurotransmitters, um, the production of neurotransmitters. So serotonin is one example. And I'm sure as science teachers, you're very familiar with these, these chemicals that are very important for brain health. But I want you to think about some of the, the, the a portion of the serotonin pathway just to illustrate um, the concept that I'm trying to put forward to you, and that is how important nutrients are for the production of serotonin. So if you see, look at this, you see that copper, B6, iron, molybdenum, et cetera, these are some of the nutrients that are required in order to make serotonin. And again, I put forward the obvious question is, will these foods provide those nutrients that are important for good optimal brain health? And I would say probably not. And just to put that into context, that I just showed you the chemical pathways involved just right there. So if you think about the all the chemical pathways that are involved in the serotonin production, then you can start to appreciate that if we don't um, eat foods that are really nourishing and nutrient rich, then we're going to miss out on an opportunity to make um, these uh, chemicals that are important for our daily functioning. So what happens if our brains don't get enough of these nutrients? I th hopefully you're going to think you're going to realize that this is obvious. You're going to start to experience um, some psychological symptoms. And this list of symptoms that I've just put up here are the symptoms that uh, that emerged. Um, through the uh, Minnesota starvation experiments that were done in the 1950s, 1960s uh, on uh, Vietnam War um, individuals, who, well, people actually who didn't want v Vietnam War uh, protesters, so they didn't want to go to Vietnam War, and instead they ended up in a study where they starved them. And this was, that's yeah, true. You wouldn't get away with this kind of research right now these days, but that's what they got up to back then. And these were, the these were the symptoms that they started to express. And so think about again, if you are eating foods that are calorie rich, nutrient poor, is it not surprising that we have a mental health crisis in New Zealand and that we have a mental health crisis in our city? And so you've probably seen all of these types of um, uh, uh, front headlines in the newspaper, our local newspaper, just highlighting the crisis that we currently have. And so I really want to uh, encourage you to consider the role that our food supply is playing in these statistics. So dietary patterns in the mental in the in the 20th century, 21st century, sorry, what do we know about it? There's actually been an enormous amount of research that's been done in this arena which is looking at what we eat and whether or not that's correlated with our mental health. And there's been over 11 epidemiological studies all over the world, um, Spain and, and the UK and in Australia and in Japan. All of them say the same thing. 
which is that the more we consume foods that are sort of traditional, um, viewed as wholesome, uh, healthy, Mediterranean style, then the lower our risk for mental health problems. And in contrast, the more we eat foods that are consistent with the Western diet, then the greater our risk for mental health problems. These studies are not just correlational, they are also longitudinal. So they followed people over a long period of time to see what's happened to them in terms of does, does what I eat today, and we are creatures of habit in terms of our food intake, does what I eat today, does that predict what happens to me four years, five years, six years down the road? And I would say absolutely the research is there. And just to make a point, just in case this wasn't obvious, there hasn't been a single study out there that has shown that the Western diet has been good for our mental health. Not a surprise, but we continue to see this as being an absolutely okay way for us to eat and our children to eat this way. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Oh, yes. Here we go. Direction of causality. Right. Vitamins and minerals. I'll get there. Hopefully, I'll, I'll answer your question. But I, you shouldn't be just thinking you can take vitamins and minerals in a pill form and then eat crap food. Not, not, the, not the, the message that I want to have come from my, my research. <laughs> That's for sure. Yes, but I'll, I'll get there. I think I, hopefully I'll touch on that. The dire in terms of the direction of causality, there have now been studies that have manipulated diet. That is, they've taken people with a mental illness like depression and, then, and, and are eating really poorly, and then they, they randomize them to a, a dietary manipulation uh, arm or a control arm, like a social support type of arm. And they found that the people who were randomized to a diet in manipulation, that is, encouraging them to eat foods that aligned with the Mediterranean-style diet, that their depression scores improved much more than the people who'd be randomized to the social control arm. So that's giving you a little bit of evidence, and there are some other studies as well that have been done that show that we can change people's um, dietary patterns, and that will have an effect on their mental health. And I've had emails from people all over the world over the last 10 years since I've been doing this research of people just wanting to tell me how they changed their diet and that that in itself was enough to completely reverse their, their mental health challenges. So the obvious solution is that we should just tell everyone to eat better, right? And eating better is a good thing and that is essential and I hope no one takes away from my research that you should just go and eat and con uh, consume a bunch of pills and that you can eat whatever you want as it's been alluded to um, in the audience. But there are some challenges and that is that we need to be, uh, take seriously the changes in our food supply and that is that we are not properly remineralizing our soils. We are using herbicides, pesticides that are having an impact on the uh, nutrient density of our food, our genetics, our matter, they do play a role in that some of us are more vulnerable to the impact of poor nutrients in food than others. And there's this in intriguing area of research that's just emerging that is looking at carbon um, dioxide emissions and the impact that those are having on nutrient levels. And I'll show you some data on that front. First, to consider the mineral content in vegetables. This was a study that looked at the um, mineral content of vegetables over a 50 year period from 1947 to 1997 in the UK. And so they taking 1990, uh, 1947 as the 100% mark, they looked at the, the levels relative to that mark. And what you can see across the board is that an apple of today is not as nourishing as an apple of the 1950s. And that has probably got to do with a lot of different things that are going on. One of them would be the poor mineralization of soil, but I also think it's the way we're selecting our food. That we're selecting foods that store well, that transport well, that look pretty, don't bruise, that have high yield. That's how we're currently selecting our food. And as a consequence, are we making our food less nourishing? That would be the question for you to think about. And that's just my, you know, if you're not selecting something for how nourishing it is, then I would say that might be a, con a direct consequence of that, um, the, the, that way that we're selecting our food. 
I showed you the serotonin pathway, and so what I want you to think about, just sort of on a fairly simplistic level, is that if you have genetic mutations that affect the, um, you know, the, the, one chemical being transferred to another because you don't have the appropriate enzyme, for example, then that's going to impair your ability to make these neurotransmitters that are important, even if they're provided to you in your food. And so we are, the work that I'm doing is operating at the level of thinking, Maybe we need to give some people more nutrients than what they can get out of their food, possibly because of these, what we'd call an inborn error of metabolism, an inability to maybe make the enzymes that are required for good brain health. And then here's the data on carbon dioxide, um, and that, the chain, that as the carbon dioxide uh, levels have increased, well, obviously carbon increases in the plants, but you see that there's a decrease in some of these really essential nutrients. I don't know the mechanism behind that. I'm, I, this has just come across my desk over the last month, but it's alarming enough that it's, again, maybe something that we need to be thinking about in terms of climate change. And so finally, in terms of the evidence of broad spectrum micronutrients, the idea here is that because of these other variables that are going on, maybe some people need more nutrients than what they can get out of their food, even if it's a good diet, then we are providing people with more nutrients and seeing whether or not that has a positive impact on their mental health. And so the, we've done studies um, in my lab, but there's also been studies that have been done all over the world, and they are all showing the same thing. And that is that if you give people a broad spectrum of micronutrients, these vitamins and minerals essential for good brain health, then you can have a positive impact in terms of changing things around. Like we looked at stress levels in the Christchurch earthquakes, in the context of Christchurch earthquakes, we gave people micronutrients to see whether or not that could help reduce stress, and absolutely it did, and much more than people who were receiving treatment as usual. Um, we replicated those findings in the context of a flood in June 2013 in Alberta, Canada, again showing that just a simple intervention of giving people micronutrients really had a great positive impact on their ability to cope with the natural disaster. To me, it's just an obvious thing is that a, a well-nourished body and brain is better able to uh, with, uh, you know, withstand the stresses associated with these ongoing environmental challenges. We are, yes, yes, so we are. We're giving people, and often in, we give them about 12 pills a day of vitamins and minerals. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a, a, I hate to call them mega doses. They are large doses, and they're taken, and you just have to think about, um, say, a calcium pill, and that's how big a calcium pill is to appreciate that some of these minerals, we actually call them macro minerals because they are quite large and bulky. So given the broad range of minerals that are out there, you can start to appreciate that you need to give people a lot of pills. So there's been research that shows, just to show a second, research that shows that reducing aggression in prisoners, um, slowing cognitive decline in the elderly, and then helping people with coping with depression, anxiety, stress, and ADHD, they're all showing the benefits. Not for everybody, it doesn't help absolutely everyone, not at all, there's about 20% of people who do not respond at all. I would say about 50% show really solid, good um, response in our control trials, yes? Yes. And I know I get a huge amount of pleasure just out of grabbing it, cooking it. Yes. Occasionally, some of it actually makes its way into the kitchen. So yeah. Nice. Yes. Yes. So, so are there studies on the effects of? Well, there are studies that have looked at the effects of, of helping people, teaching people to learn how to cook and see whether or not that has a positive effect on mental health, and yes, it does. Whether or not, it, to the extent that you're describing, whether there's been research looking at that in the context of mental health, I can't think of anything off of the top of my head. Um, that doesn't mean it necessarily hasn't been done. But I, I do want to, like if my research, which has been done on giving nutrients in pill form, has the effect that more people start to grow their own vegetables and we start to pay attention to community gardens and, and that we start to think about what we're feeding ourselves, then I feel that we've been successful. I don't, we don't want everyone to just go off and pop a pill and then eat badly. That's not the purpose of my research. But the, the, um, the beauty of doing what we're doing is that you can control a lot more variables 
than when you try to get people to change their diet because when you do that naturally there's no blinding ever involved people know if they're getting the processed food or the 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 fruits and vegetables you can't hide it and so there are some challenges associated with those studies and they get knocked down because of that issue of blinding whereas with ours it's controlled we got a placebo no one can say to me the reason why this has happened is because um, of some other variables out there. So you're standing up because you want me to slow, uh, finish, wrap up. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to show this is just one person of many, many people that we've seen. And you just see this on, off, on, off control of their ADHD symptoms when they went through one of our controlled experimental designs. So up here is above the clinical range. So you just see this amazingly uh, large changes. If you think about it in terms of those changes, it's a change of four standard deviations. And so that would be like me growing a foot right now. And you would notice that when people get well and respond to the nutrients, we tend to notice it and they do as well. And so I want to finish, can I finish with one story? And that is, regardless of all the amazing research that we've published, I still have people saying to me, but nutrients really aren't that powerful. I mean, if you've got a really serious psychiatric condition, we need to give people medications. And so I leave you with the story about the honeybee. And just thinking about the honeybee, what makes the difference in terms of the queen bee and the worker bee. They are phenotypically different, but genetically identical. One of them is fertile and one of them is sterile. What makes the difference? Anybody know? Nutrition, royal jelly, that is what makes the difference. It is simply in terms of what the queen bee is fed. That's it, that's it. Genetically identical, but completely phenotypically different. Making the difference between fertility and not fertility, is that a powerful effect? I would say it is, yes? So, to conclude, please think about what you're eating and what our children are eating. Every time we put something in our mouth, we make a choice to offer ourselves something nourishing or nutrient depleted. And just in terms of what we are doing in my lab, you've heard a little bit of the micronutrients. <laughs> I am doing this. We are collecting fecal samples. That's unfortunately not what I wanted to do as a psychologist, but we see it as being very, very relevant to un better understanding our brain health is our gut and our gut and the bacteria that are in there. So we're, do we're looking at genetics and stool samples. We're doing um, um, imaging, EEGs. We're looking at mineral content in hair. We currently have a study going on pregnancy and seeing if we can um, ensure better nutrition for women during pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you.